Why was he called Dr. Death? Harold Shipman is the world's most notorious serial killer with a victim count of 265 in a span of 25 years. What made the media call him Dr. Death, and why did he commit these horrific crimes? Hi everyone, and welcome to Obscurify, where we dive into the world of true crime, unsolved mysteries, and everything that goes bump in the night. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and bell notification to get more of our creepy content. So today, we are looking at Dr. Death, aka, Harold Frederick Shipman. He is known to be England's most notorious serial killer, if not the world. His undoing began on the 24th, of June 1988, with the death of Kathleen Grundy, the mayoress of Hyde Greater Manchester. But Harold Shipman's story begins on the 14th, of January 1943 in Bestwood, Nottingham, England. He was the middle child of Vera and Harold Shipman Sr. In most serial killer cases, we often see abuse and neglect in their childhood years, but with Harold, that was not the case. In fact, Harold had a close relationship with his mother, Vera. She doted on him, and as some sources say, he was her blue-eyed boy and invested much of her energy into him. Harold Shipman grew up in a council estate, his mother Vera did not work, she stayed home with the children, and his father Harold Sr. was a full-time truck driver. With only one income source, Harold's mother pushed her children to work and study hard for better futures. An opportunity arose when Harold passed his 11-plus exam in 1957, he was offered a full scholarship at High Pavement Grammar School. His mother, Vera, viewed this as their ticket out of their circumstances. Harold also excelled in athletics. He was a great distance runner and, in his final year, served as vice president of the athletics team. However, Harold was not naturally smart and had to study hard to get good grades. Harold's mother had the world's expectations for him and pressured him to work and study hard. When Harold was 17 years old, his mother received devastating news. She was diagnosed with lung cancer. Unfortunately, when Vera was diagnosed, it was an aggressive stage of cancer, and it was progressing rapidly. The doctors informed Vera and her family that she didn't have long left, all they could do was to make her last months as comfortable as possible. This was devastating news to Harold, but because Harold Sr. was a full-time truck driver, the care of Harold's frail mother fell to him. Shipman was very dedicated to taking care of his mother, he stopped studying and put an end to all his extracurricular activities and would go straight home after school, make her a cup of tea, and spend the afternoon talking with her. He would also accompany her to all her hospital and doctor's appointments. This is where sources believe her death became the manner of Harold's modus operandi. In the later stages of her disease, she was administered morphine. Harold witnessed how his mother's pain subsided during her terminal condition. On June 21, 1963, Shipman's mother, Vera, passed away. Harold was devastated by this. However, he never showed it, some would say Shipman even thrived. Sources say he dived into studying and running long distances just to stay away from home. At the age of 19, Harold enrolled in the University of Leeds Medical School. In his first year of university, Shipman met a girl by the name of Primrose. She was the daughter of a local farmer. Sources say he was in awe of Primrose and was never really interested in girls or relationships until he met her. It was said that there was an instant connection between the two. Primrose's parents absolutely loved Harold and felt that he was truly wonderful with her and treated her with great care. However, their carefree love story was soon struck by reality when Primrose fell pregnant. When news broke to the families of the pregnancy, chaos ensued. Harold Sr. even went as far as to tell Harold Jr. that he is glad Vera was not around to bear witness to this, and that she would be very disappointed in him. In 1966 when Primrose was five months pregnant, she and Harold got married, and their baby was born the following year. They had a daughter named Sarah. Later Sarah would be joined by three brothers, Christopher, Sam, and David. Harold then went on to graduate from Leeds Medical School in 1970, 
and got offered a job in Pontefract General Infirmary, and at the age of 28, Shipman left the hospital environment and went on to become a general practitioner at the Todd Munden Group in 1974. Their little family seemed happy and doing well in life, but little did everyone know that Harold was harboring a very dark secret. Over the years, Harold had developed a drug addiction to an opiate-based painkiller called pethidine. One of the local pharmacies raised suspicions regarding the quantities of pethidine that were being prescribed to him. When an investigation was launched and Shipman was confronted, he claimed he suffered from depression and had been addicted to injecting himself with the drug. When his addiction was discovered, he resigned from the medical center and was fined 600 pounds by the General Medical Council. However, Shipman was not struck off the medical board. Instead, he was given mandatory rehabilitation for drug abuse. By 1977, at the age of 31, Harold was back practicing medicine in Hyde, Greater Manchester. He was a GP in Donnybrook House for 15 years. It was here that Shipman built a sterling reputation with his patients as their trusted physician. In 1992, Harold left Donnybrook House to start his own practice across the street from Donnybrook. He also poached 3,000 of their patients, with an added waiting list. Shipman's patients adored him, and sources claimed he always went the extra mile for his patients, from making them feel comfortable, to doing home visits. This gave the community the impression that he was a GP who genuinely cared, he was viewed as Hyde's most trusted GP, which is what makes what he did all the more disturbing. But when three of Harold Shipman's patients died suddenly during their daily routines, the coroner flagged these deaths to Dr. Booth who then raised her concerns to a new doctor who joined the community, Dr. Linda Reynolds. She already had her suspicions about the number of death certificates that were signed for Shipman. When Linda researched this further, she noticed that Shipman's death rate was three times that of any other GP in town. On March 24, 1994, Dr. Linda Reynolds reported her findings to a coroner Dr. Pollard, who then informed the police. An investigation was launched but soon concluded that there was not enough evidence to support the allegations and was closed just after four weeks of investigation. Harold felt a sense of relief, but that will be short-lived. On June 25, 1998, Harold visited one of his patients, 81-year-old Kathleen Grundy. Kathleen was a wealthy, successful woman and the former mayor of Hyde. On this particular day, Kathleen booked an early blood test with Harold Shipman at 8.30 a.m. But when Kathleen did not show up for her shift at the charity shop, her co-workers started to become concerned. When afternoon arrived, and no one has heard from Kathleen, two of her co-workers decided to take a short walk to her house. It was there that they found her door unlocked and entered her home to find her dead on her sofa, fully dressed. They called her family and her GP. Harold Shipman to inform them of her death. When Harold arrived, he ruled her death as old age. Her family was shocked, Kathleen was a vibrant and energetic woman for her age, but instead of raising their concerns, they trusted Shipman. Just a week after Kathleen's body was found, a funeral was held, but this was not the end of Kathleen's story. After Kathleen's death, her attorney got in contact with Kathleen's daughter and raised concerns regarding her will. In Kathleen's will, it was stated that she would leave everything to her GP, Harold Shipman, and nothing to her daughter. This made no sense to her attorney or her daughter and agreed for her to come and view her will. Kathleen's daughter knew from the first look that this was not her mother's will. The will was typed by a typewriter and Kathleen was known to have beautiful handwriting and wrote all her important documents by hand. Kathleen's daughter also remarked that the will seemed very rushed and had a lot of grammatical errors. Her mother was a well-educated woman, and the mayor of Hyde, she insisted her mother knew how to talk grammatically correctly. She was convinced that this will was not written by her mother but by someone else. She found old letters that her mother had written and compared them to the signature on the will, and noticed that the signature on the will didn't match, it was bumpy and looked as if it had been traced. 
with her mother's attorney Kathleen's daughter went to the local police to report their findings, the police started their investigation on the day of Kathleen's death. Kathleen had a blood test scheduled with Harold Shipman at 8.30 a.m. that morning but police found that no blood sample was sent to the lab. When the investigators started to suspect that Kathleen's death was not as it seemed, they had to make the hard decision to exhume her body and perform an autopsy to rule out the cause of death. When the toxicology report came back to the lab, it found that on the day of Kathleen's death had a dangerously high level of morphine in her system. Kathleen was not a drug abuser, therefore her family knew that she was killed via lethal injection, and they had only one suspect, Dr. Harold Shipman. That same day the police went to Shipman's surgery, he was not there but the typewriter was. Police took the typewriter into custody to compare it to Kathleen Grundy's will. The police typed out the entire will exactly the same, to compare the two. From the spaces between the letters and the ink, it matched Kathleen's will. This was all that the police needed and on September 7, 1998, Harold Shipman was arrested. But Harold was not arrested in public due to the media and journalists who got wind of the story. The police department called Shipman and told him that he was being arrested and that could he come to the station, and Harold obliged. During interrogation, Harold denied all the evidence given to him but ultimately his biggest downfall was his patient's records, police had a theory for this. Harold Shipman kept two records, one on paper, and one online, and these two records, rarely matched. The police theory goes, whenever Shipman decided he wanted to murder one of his patients, he would falsely add information online to a patient's records of symptoms of a stroke or anything, he could later then determine as their death. What the police could not determine was Harold's motive, but since then psychologists had theorized that it goes back to his mother and that he was reenacting those afternoons with her. After the arrest of Harold Shipman, the investigators began to go through every single one of Harold Shipman's patients' death records throughout his entire career. Because it became clear to the investigators that any one of his patients' death certificates could have been forged. Unfortunately, the only concrete way the investigators could prove this was through an autopsy. But since Harold Shipman has been a doctor for 25 years it was impossible to exhume all of the bodies where some of his patients were cremated. So investigators decided to only perform autopsies on Shipman's most recent victims. Police have managed to find 14 of Shipman's victims, and exhumed all 14 of their graves to perform tests and autopsies. The results came back for all 14 victims, they all were killed by a lethal dose of morphine, exactly the same as Kathleen Grundy. Harold Shipman's trial began on October 5, 1999 at Preston Crown Court. He was charged with the murder of 15 women by lethal injections of morphine. His victims are Marie West, 81 years old, on the 6th of March, 1995. Irene Turner, 67 years old, on the 11th of July, 1996. Lizzie Adams, 77 years old, on the 28th of February, 1997. Jean Lilly, 58 years old, on the 25th of April, 1997. Ivy Lomas, 63 years old, on the 27th of May, 1997. Muriel Grimshaw, 76 years old, on the 14th of July, 1997. Marie Quinn, 67 years old, on the November 24th, 1997. Kathleen Wagstaff, 81 years old, on the December 9th, 1997. Bianca Pomfret, 49 years old, on the December 10th, 1997. Nora Nuttall, 65 years old, on the 26th of January, 1998. Pamela Hillier, 68 years old, on the 9th of February, 1998. Maureen Ward, 57 years old, on the 18th of February, 1998. Winifred Meller, 73 years old, on the May 11th, 1998. Joan Melia, 73 years old, on the 12th of June, 1998. Kathleen Grundy, 81 years old, on the June 24th, 1998. On January 31st, 2000, 
the jury deliberated and found Harold Frederick Shipman guilty of all 15 counts of murder and one count of forgery. Shipman was sentenced to life imprisonment at Wakefield Prison, with the recommendation that he be subject to a whole life tariff. During his imprisonment investigators needed to determine Harold Shipman's true number of victims. The investigators set up criterias for all the victims by determining who died of natural causes and who was a genuine victim. And if the victim matched at least one of these criterias they would investigate further. 1. Were they in general good health at the time of their death? Was their death very unexpected? 2. Had Harold Shipman visited them shortly before the time of their death? 3. Where was the patient found? and what were the circumstances under which their body was found. During the whole ordeal, Primrose maintained that her husband was not guilty, even after his conviction. On January 13, 2004, one day before his 58th birthday, Harold Frederick Shipman was declared dead at 8.10 a.m. by suicide. A statement from the prison service indicated that he had hanged himself from the window bars of his cell using his bed sheets. His motive for suicide was never established, however, he reportedly told his probation officer he was considering suicide to ensure his wife's financial security after he was stripped of his pension. For the victim's families, they will never get the answers or the closure as to why he committed these crimes, they felt justice hasn't really been served as he only served two years of a life sentence for his crimes. And that is all I have on the horrific case of Dr. Death, a.k.a. Harold Frederick Shipman. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you would love to see more of our content, hit that subscribe button. Until then, stay curious.